There were a lot of tailings along the floodplain, and in 1908, we had the largest flood um, in the state of Montana, and particularly on uh, uh, the Clark Fork system. This is Milltown Dam <laughs> overflowing, uh, and uh, the powerhouse. The dam had not quite been completed, but it did hold. Um, so the reservoir behind it lost about 70% of its capacity, filled up with tailings and natural sediments. So you can imagine how much sediment is still being carried by that water. I, I, I suppose it's somewhere in Lake Ponderé. Um, so what do you do to fix these tailings that are all along the stream from Butte all the way to Missoula? Well, we're going to start with a, a little piece. It was the first piece of Silver Bow Creek that was rebuilt. It was rebuilt by uh, ARCO. Um, so here was the Colorado tailings. Here was the smelter itself. But So they used to slurry their tailings down here. Um, and this is Silver Bow Creek running right around the Colorado tailings. That's Montana Street running right up there. So this is what it looks like at eye level. You can imagine this is a tailing surface. Too much acid, too much metals, nothing grows. Um, so you can imagine what happens when it rains on that surface. The other problem with what was going on there is there was a lot of groundwater, contaminated groundwater input into the creek. So first of all, you dig up all the tailings and get them out of there. Um, so this is kind of how thick the tailings were. I don't know, it's probably six feet. You can see the old buried soil horizon. What looks like a lake is actually the water table. They had to go down below the water table to excavate. So the next thing is you come back in. This is called building in the wet. And if I remember, I'm going to show you building in the dry. So they're working. They brought in all this clean soil. And they're working with a live river. And they're putting up this fabric log to protect the bank. They can seed those logs, or they can stuff willow um, cuttings into them and they'll get stuff to grow to protect the bank. You can see they've lined it with rock, rock here, and hay bales there. Um, you can imagine what would happen if they had had a large flood. They would have lost probably a couple million dollars worth of soil. Um, this is Butte High students down on the new built floodplain. You can see now the willers are coming in. Um, and uh, by 2006, it looks like that, the willows are now holding this together really well. Um, so that was right in Butte. The state DEQ is taking on, that was one mile of creek. The state is taking on like 23, oh, it says 24 miles, right there. 24 miles of creek. This was uh, at Ramsey Flats. Uh, this was the most extensive deposit. Um, you can see here that it actually on Ramsey Flax, we would get these blue salts in the summer. Blue salt or copper salts. And salts are salts. When it rains on that, they dissolve like that. And um, part of the story should be copper was the way we made money, but aquatic life is extremely sensitive to copper too. So copper is the two sides of the coin, if you will. So here's building in the dry the way the state did it. Um, and Honestly, these two rebuildings of a river, um, this is in the infancy of how do you, how do you rebuild a river. Um, it, this was a major project, a world-class project. So, and um, me. Huh? so one of the things that Butte is trying to, to, to read, uh, the new story we want to tell, is there's nowhere in the world where you have a larger concentration of professionals in the restoration economy. So literally, the stuff that Joe's going down here didn't exist until we did it here. And one of the things we're, we're really are coming to understand about the value we offer now, which is not copper to light the world, it's now the concept of the professionals who've done this to go in and clean up sites like this, to go to other places, not just the United States, but in the world. We've had uh, visitors from Mongolia who were talking uh, about a mine that wanted to go in and what would they need to ask of that to make sure they didn't have the same things afterwards. We have this kind of status we're starting to build for a community from a you know, economic development standpoint of a restoration economy. Um, so, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but right no, when you get good. into like, literally, yeah, what he's showing you, 
the, the process and the science and the really just hundreds of badasses who live here now. Here is building in the dry. You can see over here they're removing tailings on the floodplain, so they got an excavator and haul trucks. Um, and down here they're rebuilding a new channel. Um, so they're putting in these uh, soil lifts. Those will be the banks. They'll plant willows in them. Uh, they've brought in clean soil back in here. And they've left the old contaminated channel in place for the moment. Um, and it's what they'll do is once they've finished this channel, they'll turn the water into it and then they'll go back and clean out this, this the old channel. Um, so this was that Ramsey flat section. Uh, all of these white areas are the tailings and the barren areas. Um, in 2014 they've finished it. So we, you can see they've built it's actually, in my opinion, a little bit over-engineered, but, um, and I just talked to the project manager uh, a couple of days ago, and they're starting to get beavers in there. And, and originally, he said, here's the thing, we're gonna get the vegetation established, we'll take beavers out if we have to. Now, this is well established, he says, beavers have at it, and beavers will actually re-naturalize this whole aquatic system, and, and they will do what engineers can't really figure out how to do. Where, where do the tailings go that have to be removed? They have gone over to the Opportunity Ponds, which are not ponds, they're dry tailings ponds. So Anaconda has five square miles of tailings, and, and that same project manager, Joel Chavez, uh, likes to say, we're going to take all the rats and put them in one trap. So that's where they go. Um, and that, Joe, that includes the Milltown Dam? Yeah, actually, yeah, all the Milltown Reservoir sediments came back up to Opportunity as well. It's a good place for them. It, 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 is, it is another place that will be managed forever. So it's, it gets a, a grass cap on it, and um, it's called a waste management area, and they'll have monitoring wells there, and... Are they, is that lined? No, it is not. So, um, good so, question, huh? No, they would have had to dig everything up, put a liner down, and then put everything back over five square miles. No, it's not lined. Uh, hopefully, the water balance works out. We could get into that sometime if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was that was Ramsey Flat. I mean, yeah, this is uh, Ramsey Flat, Silver Bow Creek, and Brown Gulch coming in. We're going to be standing right here in this next photo. So that's what it looks like now. It's all grasses and um, so let's talk about that. That's the story about Silver Bow Creek and the streamside tailings and the cleanup. Let's turn to groundwater and abandoned mine drainage or acid mine drainage. This is one of the pump stations um, at the high ore mine. So uh, underground mining required dewatering as well as the Berkeley pit. So they drew wa the water table way down. This water, well, I'll get to it in a minute. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I do, right there. So 1870s to 1982, they were dewatering the wine mines approximately eight cubic feet per second were going straight to Silver Bow Creek um, it was very acidic it had so much copper in it they could extract copper out of it um, this is actually the water that is now going to fill the Berkeley pit so um, this is a cross section through the 10,000 miles of underground workings. Um, so here's the bottom of the Berkeley pit. Um, these red lines going down are some of the shafts. There's actually a lot more shafts, but these deepest workings are about a mile, a mile deep. So you get the idea of this huge deep network. So they dropped the water table all the way down to there. Um, so 1955. They had really taken out all of the big ore veins, and they needed to find a way to uh, mine low, lower grade ore. Um, so the veins were like, I don't know, like up to like 50% copper they could be some of the minerals. Um, this is probably, at best, this would have been maybe 1% copper. 2%? That's what I've heard about right now they are mining 0.2% copper. 
Um, so early Berkeley pit, um, grow on a bit, grow some more. And that's kind of what it looked like uh, when they finished. So where we're standing, this is probably your viewing stand that you own, or like to pretend you own. Right? Someday John? I will. That's right. Someday you will. <laughs> when you're king of the world, John. No. So it's about, it's about, and this is the deepest part right here, it's about 1,800 feet from where we're standing down to the bottom. Um, mine now has, it's pumping tailings over 700 feet up to here. Pretty expensive, it never ends. So they pump it in a slurry? They pump it in a slurry, yes. So it's not just pumping water, it's pumping this really dense stuff uphill. Um, so Earth Day, ironically enough, 1982, Arco, in a unilateral decision, a nice corporate decision said, you know, we bought this mine and we're not really miners, we're actually an oil company. Let's just turn off the damn pump. We're paying $2 million a year to pump water. So they did. And um, so they ended up with, yeah, the lake. Um, so there's the town of Butte uh, on the edge of the pit. When they were pumping the water out, where was it going? Into the creek. Into the creek. Straight to the creek. Actually, it was the worst insult to the aquatic life in the creek yeah. was that direct mine water going in. I, I don't remember if I have that. I, the first, there was a guy named Spindler. He was the first um, environmental manager for ARCO. And, and um, no, it would have been for the Anaconda Company. And he wrote a paper. They were trying to... Um, uh, decrease the amount of metals and stuff that were going to the creek, changing their operation. So here's the um, here's the way the rise looks in the underground. So you start out here in, on Earth Day, and it just jumps up several thousand feet within like a year, um, and then it starts to curve off. It curves off for two reasons. One is Anytime you pump a well down and then turn off the pump, the water will rise in the well real quickly and then it slows down and slows down. But in addition to that, when it reached the Berkeley pit, it suddenly had a vast expanse of area it could fill. So that really slowed it down. I think that's why you get the sharp inflection in that curve. So yeah, 60 years the current rise. So the solution to this whole thing is that right now, gosh, I, I've just given so many different presentations, I can't remember what's in this one. Um, right now, the, the remedy is um, all of the water in the 10,000 miles of underground workings is now reporting to the Berkeley pit. So yeah, all of this underground uh, system is flooding and water's rising. But it, it all slopes downhill to the pit. I mean, we have a lot of well, uh, mine shafts and wells out there that are monitored every month, so we know exactly where the water table is and we know what's going on. Um, and in the year 2023 is when they have to start this treatment system. <coughs> They've already built the first version of a lime addition treatment plant. This will not quite cut it, we now understand. One of the main problems is this will meet the metal standard, so arsenic, cadmium, copper, lead, and zinc, and probably a few others. This will take it out. But as what you're doing is exchanging calcium for those metals. So the metals go as a precipitate and calcium goes into solution, and this does nothing for the high levels of sulfate in there. So uh, for one thing, people have talked about precipitating gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. More of a problem is that they won't be able to pass something called the whole effluent toxicity test. And that they take two different organisms, one's a fathead minnow and one's ceridaphnia, a water flea, and they have to run these tests with these organisms in the water. They change the water, I think, daily. The ceridaphne have to raise three broods, so they have to reproduce. Now, of course, they have to survive and raise three broods. The problem with it is, is this water is probably too salty. There's just too much stuff dissolved in it for a sensitive um, 
thing like a serodaphne to live. So, and to add a little bit on that, that in perpetuity solution that we've we've talked about is our solution, the solution we've been given. Um, that plant is going to pump just at the exact level of the infill. So it's never going to pump it down. You'll never see a dry hole. So just at the level it's continuing infilling, we will be pumping away. When we talk in perpetuity, we're talking longer than the pyramids have been on the earth. This is the kind of solution we've been saddled with. You really need to put that in your head. We're talking about motors and pumps that are supposed to run longer and being replaced, obviously. But the solution itself is supposed to run longer than anything that man has ever built has existed. So I need you to put that in your head again, that this is a solution we've been offered. And it's a solution we don't have an opportunity to contribute to a discussion in, in those closed and private negotiations on the consent decree. So again, just uh, some other details, and uh, I guess I love to interject. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Well, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> this is a big thing for me, obviously, yeah. This, obviously, I know we've talked about how the discussion tour kind of closed, but um, I mean, was there, do you know if as part of those discussions there was kind of a, you know, hopeful Internet of Things type approach to this is the technology that we have now and yeah, yeah there's you know, a hopefully five -year in review. perpetuity. There's a five-year review process in which every five years they're supposed to look at the remedy and say, is it working and is there new technology? Okay. And I think with some of the frustrations as a community member and also as a member of, of just you know, what we've had to do in the past, in the last th two five-year reviews, new technologies and tests of them have been brought forward to the EPA to say, look, there might be reason to take a look at this. And EPA thus far has summarily dismissed them without discussion. So that's part of the problem is that there's this community involvement um, that is backed by science, backed by, I mean, millions of dollars have been sent on studies to prove these new technologies, or these new um, models of the, of the solution. And they really just haven't met with, with a response. Is, sir, follow? Yeah. Um, is some of that related to um, funding, do you know, specifically? I mean, I know there's a lot going on with the national budget and the state budget. Uh, it's not national budget this time, but you got to remember, Superfund has been defunded. Right. It's been defunded for a long time. The, the responsible party, uh, Joe made an allusion British to it earlier. British Petroleum now. Yeah, right. basically, it's, yeah, it's, it's BP. Um, they're responsible underneath the lawsuit of paying for the remedy, but again, they did a really, really good job. Joe said something earlier. There is, There are solutions. I mean, and to be honest, you know, various ranges of the solutions are just three of those new fighter jets we're building right now. If you didn't build those and you took that money and put it here, <laughs> we'd be clean. Okay, so it's not it's not technical practicability. It's so far as the money that that Arco, sorry, Arco and now BP were holding to, is not enough to do a full clean. It's enough to put in a solution that protects human health, which is the letter of the law, not to restore to original conditions, which is not the letter of the law. So, Thank you. So the, the other thing is I, I would mention is, uh, so the process goes along, you do the studies, the EPA writes a record of decision, they say, you know, they, they've already named who's going to pay for it, and they sort of name what the, uh, what the remedy's going to be, but then they go into negotiations for a consent decree, and who signed this consent decree was simply ARCO, Montana Resources, the current operator, um, EPA, and the state of Montana. That's signed. So there's now a legally binding contract between all those entities that says this is the remedy. End of story. There is a part still in the timeline that says before we, before they get to this point where they have a built and operating plant, they have to look at any new technology that's out there. So there is a step in there where they will have to look at that. Yeah. So these closed door conversations, are they with the stakeholders that you just said, or who's there besides in the, in the new one, it, it, Montana Resources doesn't participate. They were named a responsible party. They don't participate. Um, but the other party that w is in those is Butte Silver Bow County government. So our, our uh, county attorney and our planning director and... But very specifically are not allowed to communicate what... They can't tell us oh, so what's okay. going on. Even though that. we are represented as a public we're represented, we're not allowed to know in any way what's happening there while we're being represented. And, and, and Until the outcome comes up. It, it's difficult because it is so big and complex, what they're dealing with now, which is 
groundwater and soils and stuff that is right outside of this mine flooding situation. So um, they're working on that now. You, um, it, it is so complex that you kind of go, well, does Butte Silver Bow have the money to actually have technical expertise that can keep up with the discussions? The answer is absolutely not. I mean, it was hard for me when I was with DEQ to keep up on this. Um, and I got some help from Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology on groundwater. And uh, there's another guy, he's a PhD surface water modeler that I started working with um, for surface water and our arguments about surface water. But it, it, you can imagine the money that Atlantic Richfield puts into their consultants. So it's, it's a... It's a lot. And lobbyists. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah it, 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 so this is the picture today. Just uh, this is a good view. This is, in a way, maybe a better view than we would have had it in the snowstorm. But yeah. um, hey, you never know. We might still get a sneak out there. So here's all the waste rock that they've piled up. Um, so anytime you're anytime you're mining, you have a strip ratio, which means you have to move waste rock to get your ore. And uh, their current strip ratio is about two to one. Two, two. Two scoops of waste rock to one scoop of ore. Um, and the ore is only half a percent. No, it's 0.2%. Oh, point two, sorry, point two. Point, I think it's like 0.23% roughly. But still two thirds of the copper is still on the ground? Yes. Even yeah, but it's, yeah, it's more disseminated or it's, more, it's a lot deeper. Mm -hmm. There's deeper stuff down there too. Um, so here's Lake Berkeley. Um, and here's, so here's the concentrator. Here's where they get the ore, they crush it, they mill it, they extract the concentrate, and then they pump the tailings as a slurry up to right in here. The tailings run across this surface, so this is now downhill. The natural valley, that was downhill. But um, it runs across this surface, so up at this near, su near end, um, the coarser stuff's falling out. It's kind of fine sand size. You get out here, and it's 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 silts and clays. They they used to call them slimes. Um, and then at the back side is a lake formed by the water that's decanting off of the tailings. And then here's the original Silverbow Creek. Here was Dixie Creek, and here's Yankee Doodle Creek. So there's clean water coming into it. This is now a closed circuit mine. They discharge no water and they haven't since MR started operating it. There's a pump station right there. They pump this water down to operate their concentrator. Even with that amount of water, they still have to bring in additional water. Uh, let's see, what else? Well, if you guys were, if we were sitting at Butte High School, because that's why I had set this up, there's where we would be sitting. Um, uh, there's East Middle School. So um, this is the new pit. Um, if, if you were familiar enough with it, you would realize now that they've, they've gotten all the way up here and they're taking that part down. Um, see, anything else I need to show there? Well, no. I'm gonna and so on. where's the, the original stream bed is kind of... Uh, it, it comes through this side of it. So it came down like this and through here and, you know, the. The town of uh, Meterville sat right in there. Um, and then there's where the old channel starts up, is that little slot right there. But that's a wholly constructed channel now. Joe, what year was that photo? Boy, you know, it was taken by a space shuttle astronaut, and I want to say um, early 2000s or maybe even late 90s. Seems like I've had that for a long time. I don't remember when somebody went, oh, look at this picture. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's good. One. But, um, that was before Google Earth was around, I think, or easy to work with. One thing you need to realize is that, um, like I said, the Berkeley Pit forms a capture system. Um, but there's, there's a groundwater divide here. So here's the Berkeley. Um, and all, all, of the, all of the water in these workings are sloping downhill, so flowing downhill to the Berkeley. But there's another aquifer system, it's the alluvial aquifer system, so it's gravels, not bedrock. 
and it's flowing that way. And um, so um, there are these two aquifer systems that both are going to recover. This is contaminated by, I don't know if anybody here has ever heard the term uh, the parrot tailings. But here it's kind of a topic. And uh, they were tailings left in the ground on this side of the divide. The um, copper levels in the groundwater are higher than they are in the Berkeley pit. The pH of the water is about two and a half. You can pump the water out of the ground and plate copper onto iron with it. It's blue. It's about that color. Um, so here was where I, I explained before how we cleaned up the Colorado tailings. The other thing they had to do was do something about groundwater. They knew groundwater was getting to the creek too. Um, so before and after, they've taken out the Colorado tailings. They've now built uh, a lime addition treatment plant here. They've built a new floodplain. And is what they realized was if they measured the load of copper here, say it's 10 pounds per day, then they could go down here and measure the load of copper, and it was 25 pounds per day. And so you go, some are gaining a lot, and it was gaining, almost all of it was gaining through groundwater. That's how they knew this. So they took, once they, they um, originally you had, here's the water, in cross section, here's the water table sloping down to the stream, right? And so the stream's gaining um, all of this uh, contaminated groundwater. When they rebuilt that floodplain, they said, aha, so they raised it up here so that they're now no longer going to gain that groundwater. As a matter of fact, they may be losing a little bit of clean water to the groundwater. They left the old channel largely in place, and it goes right along here, and it's doing such a damn good job of capturing contaminated groundwater. It still does. Um, it goes to this pond here, and they pump it up here, lime it, and the reason those look light green is there's particles settling out, and it's reflect, refracting the light, uh, making it look green. So another fairly in perpetuity, maybe not as long of in perpetuity, because um, this is just the pair of tailings instead of the ore body that has to wear itself out. Um, so this is where the parrot tailings is, uh, are. Uh, and Martin, just to give you a frame of reference, um, so the Civic Center? Does anybody know where the Civic Center is? It's or? right in the back parking lot of the Civic Center is what we're talking about. This is, that's if anybody's right. driven down Harrison Avenue, yeah, that's Harrison right. Avenue, and you pass by the Civic Center right there. Um, this was the old Silverbell Creek course right along there. Um, so they had to put in this brown line is an area, again, they decided, EPA decided it was technically impracticable to remove those tailings and clean that area up. State disagrees. But they, they put in another groundwater capture system there. And so that water is now pumped down to that treatment system. Um, and um, this is my guest appearance in this show, I guess. I don't know why I put this. This is a, this is a cool. slag wall canyon. It's kind of cool. It's kind of cool for Montanans because you can go put your waders on and walk down there. And Arco nor Silver Bow Creek, uh, nor Butte Silver Bow can tell you to get the hell out of the creek because of our stream access law. <laughs> so I like to wade it. It's kind of fun. <laughs> um, so here was, yeah, here's the parrot tailings. Here's what is in big argument is um, this is the plume, or the states argue that's the size of the plume. It goes all the way down to, here's the confluence. Um, so this is where it's probably hitting the creek. This is Black Blacktail Creek coming in here. Um, and then this is where that sub-drain is. The two arguments that the state has, I, might, I can't remember what's in this thing. The two arguments the state has is we don't think your subdrain is necessarily captured. Ten minutes. Woo. Uh, and huh? You're doing great. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to rush through some parts, but big arguments. We don't think your capture system is captured at all, and we think that in the future the parrot tailings will drive this plume to move further. 
And really quick, it's not just an argument, it's, it's bounded by fact. Some of those millions of dollars of studies that have been done have been gone down in drill wells, pull water up, and you can characterize the water all the way down at that other creek from the water that originates at the parent. It's very easy to characterize that that's the same water. We've presented those, those findings, those details, and you're asking, well, hey, you, you know, isn't there a, a process by which we can get them to, to see things? Well, this is one of those really great examples that that data was presented and EPA said no. So that's still that argument that occurs is that it is it is it is quantified, um, but there is now a process by which that you know that juggernaut that is Superfund has to get through its process to come to understand that that data means something and what we're up to. I'd also add to that that so the way it's gone is that. Um, most of the documents now have been written by Arcos consultants, and you know the volume just on that one issue, it's probably about that thick. And it took a long time for me to sort of keep up on it. As kind of a lone DEQ person, there was natural resource damage people that had some uh, expertise in it, but Arcos kind of got the main bulk of the discussion sitting there now. Um, so the worst problem still is stormwater, and this is at the upper end of that channel. The Civic Center is right behind us. But you can see when it rains, the only time there's water in this part of the channel is when it rains. There's no longer through flow. There's uh, uh, a groundwater capture system, so there's no groundwater getting into it. Um, what would be the problem with stormwater? Well, this is what most of the, hill, the upper part of the hill looked like, was these barren dumps. So one of the things they had to do was come in and uh, they would cut down the, those steep slopes um, and they would then lay down a layer of lime if it was uh, below five and a half pH and then they would uh, put soil down and cover it with grass. So no longer the severe erosion like that, um, and when is this free to stream? Well, there's a good picture of one. Um, and this is our uh, sub sewer system, our, our storm sewer system. You can see the blue salts that form on it. So it's not only the stuff that's wa washing off the streets or that used to wash off of those waste dumps. There's problems underground and we, is what it is the piping and the storm sewer systems were built in the day when the best backfill material was probably tailings or waste rock. Readily available, let's bring it in and build the system and backfill it with that. Um, that's kind of the look of the storm sewer. I'm going to have to rush through this part. So, actually, where are we at today? We, we do have fish in the creek, um, and I, mean, I don't know how to rush through this too much, but this is fish wildlife in parks. This is probably 15 years ago, um, and he's got a little electric, it's an electric backpack shocker. So this wand sends out electric current, it stuns the fish, they scoop them up with a net, put them in a bucket, and they can count them and weigh them, and it's a fish survey. So first thing that showed up were sculpins. Um, Native fish, fairly tolerant of metals and nutrients, low oxygen. Next thing, it showed up about the same time, uh, suckers. And suckers are also native fish, so good sign, at least we get fish back. And uh, they're also very tolerant of low oxygen and metals. Um, the first trout that showed up, um, not a salmon, but this is a brookie, um, and, and this was Took a while. It was a few years later. Um, this wasn't the first one, but I, I just like this picture. Um, uh, that's a that's a spawning male brook trout. I never knew they looked like that. Really brilliant colors too. Um, and this is just downstream of, of Butte. Um, this is another fish biologist, and our sewage treatment plant is right around the corner. And so Joe Notton said, you know what? There's cutthroat trout right down here kind of hiding in there. And I think they were kind of hiding in the part over here that water's not very well mixed. This is probably Silverboat Creek water 
and that's still mostly sewage treatment plant water, but he had to come down and approve it. <coughs> um, those are the fish that are coming out of Durant Canyon. Durant Canyon's an interesting tributary <coughs> in that it has been cut off for a hundred years from uh, the rest of the upper Clark Fork by this severe contamination in Silverbow Creek. Um, and this is where they think the cutthroat come from. The brook trout have been living in Blacktail Creek all the way up above the mining for a long time. Matt Vincent, our uh, last chief executive, as a boy used to go up there fishing on Blacktail Creek and catch brook trout. But this is down right by German Gulch. Um, and that's a damn big cutthroat. So um, I'm not going to be able to get into this part of it. but. Um, this guy right here, he's the contaminant biologist for this region, including the Clark Fork. Um, if you talk to him, he will tell you, yeah, we've got fish there, but it doesn't look the way it should look yet. Um, and so um, they're still not meeting the standards they need to meet. Um, and hopefully we will push them to, to get this done right. But, as John and I have been saying, we're kind of locked out of the discussion of the consent decree. Did they do any like toxicology reports on that? Animals? They've done a few. They have, you know, interestingly enough, um, they opened Silverbow Creek up to catch and release fishing. Catch and release because there's not enough numbers. They really don't want you removing the fish. Um, they did some studies. They did. Uh, a mercury body burden. This is one of the few streams that doesn't have a mercury problem. They, they don't have a mercury warning. So, um, yeah, it, this is my uh, a lot of graphs, right? This is the science. This is the stuff that I can work on. Let me let me show you this one because this one's uh, this is uh, gonna go back one. So. Here's that groundwater treatment plant I talked about. Um, here's the sewage treatment plant, and their effluent line comes right around here. So we have a stream monitoring station right here, stream monitoring station right here. Um, uh, EPA in 2008, a document called the sewage treatment, this treated sewage effluent, the largest tributary source of coffee. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks came in and said, we're, we're going to do a, there is on Silverbell Creek. They said, we're going to put caged fish in the creek. So they put one cage up here, one cage down here. And the cages are about like that. And so they're flow through cells just sitting in the creek and they put fingerlings in there. They have to come and feed them. But this is, they had some real, and it was that, uh, the guy holding the big trout, Trevor Selch, that conducted this. Um, so, um, the blue, I think this goes as a, it'll animate itself, I think, in a second. This line is the copper in the stream upstream. The orange is the copper in the stream downstream. This red line on the, on the side here, this is the copper compliance ratio. Uh, the standard is based on the hardness in the stream at the time you take the sample. So the standard's always bouncing around. So you just take, you take, uh, and you take the copper concentration and divide it by, this, by the standard, and you come up with a ratio. Pretty simple to understand. If it's above one, it's not good. If it's below one, you're OK. So here we are. And obviously, downstream, we've been getting these spikes. And they're obviously associated with the sewage treatment plant. Well, upstream, downstream, just like I said. We had a rain event. And our sewage treatment plant is not designed this way, but we get big surges of water during rain events. So is what we had was 100% mortality downstream, zero mortality upstream. Science doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> Field science, anyways. So this is. You know, it's really hard to document a fish kill, but I guess this is one way to do it. And this is not even, I, 
Well, yeah. <laughs> it was a fight I had with EPA. I mean, and their lawyer, and it was. Yeah. I don't know where it's gone now. I'm retired. I gotta learn to relax. My wife tells me I get too excited about this. Um, so, managing groundwater in, per in perpetuity. What does it mean? Um, I don't know. You know, you look at. There's got to be some institution that's going to manage this forever. So, jokingly, I mean, it's pretty full of Irish, um, and uh, you know, I can envision a, a, a monastery on the side of the pit and the monks up there. But um, you know, when I presented this here, we have a S Serbian Orthodox Church, and I had to say, of course, the Serbian Orthodox, uh, the Orthodox Church has got a longer history than the Catholic Church, and the couple of ladies said, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, this was to us guys, so ultimate, you know, we live here, so. This is a program uh, that's housed up at Montana Tech, uh, where we get, uh, mostly it's aimed at K through 12, and teaching them what's happened on the Clark Fork, so they, we go to schools, from Butte all the way to Missoula, and we do a couple of days in the class, and then we try and get them out on the river, and we hope they remember some of this, <laughs> realize what a big deal it is. Am I all right? Okay. That was it. <laughs>
And the guy who owned the cafe said, cool, and he, he gave the bar to a museum, and eventually it came out. And that's why we've got it now, so you don't have to tell that story. But between <coughs> that time, they basically got everybody out of here, kicked them all out, or burned their houses down, and then continued to mine out. And this was starting again in the late 70s. So if you right over the edge here, you can see the, um, the Belmont uh, uh, head frame right there. Over that edge right there, there's a big ore body, and one take a pit and go in that direction. A lot of people wouldn't sell. And what was happening was, is for a period of about two years, every night a house burned down. in this neighborhood over here just mysteriously would burn down. And then basically that got up to the late 80s, late 80s, they, they laid out and bought that pill, that mine in Chile, because they didn't have to pay union wages, they didn't have to do all their stuff, and they just shut it this thing. So they burnt all that down to try to take over that area to expand the pit. And that's asked 